Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It is a dark and stormy night. I hesitate to call it night because it should be bright daylight, but it is dark outside. I just drove home through a uh, horrible storm and I looked like I maybe had just gotten out of the shower. I was completely drenched when I walked in. So interestingly enough, it was like 98 degrees, like an hour ago and we were sweating to death and now I'm actually cold because I was like chilled to the bone in the rain. So yay, let's just hope, keep our fingers crossed that the power does not go out. It's actually flickered a couple times on me already. So if the live stream suddenly stops in mid sentence, hopefully what I was saying was profound, uh, but that's what happened. <laughs> the power has gone out and there's nothing. While I can work at my shop with no power, I cannot broadcast over the internet with no power. So hopefully, Hopefully that will not happen. So, hey, welcome back. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about the question that I get time and time and time again, how flat is flat enough? Short answer, it depends. It depends entirely on the situation. I will lead by saying that if you are working with power tools, especially if you're working solely with power tools, your definition of flat is a lot flatter than my definition of flat working with hand tools. The more power tools that you add into your workflow, the flatter, the, the greater the tolerance, the higher the tolerance, or is it lower the tolerance? The lower the tolerance, I think, the flatter your stuff needs to be because of the, the thing I talk about all the time, you're taking wood to the tool rather than tool to the wood. And every single surface has to run off of that flat table saw base, that flat joiner base, flat planer base, bandsaw, et cetera, et cetera. So it's something to think about. What I'm gonna talk about today is the hand tool shop. And a lot of, shall I say, um, out of flattedness that is permissible when we're working with hand tools. When you start integrating a, a, a power tool, even if it's just one into the workflow, you have to rethink things and think about, is this flat enough? But. Um, I did want to, I had a couple of uh, questions in the chat room before we even started rolling here. So I had just a couple of easy ones that I wanted to uh, roll with. Granted asked, where and how are my saws stored? Um, my hand saws are over here in my saw till. Um, throw a little light on that. Um, the uh, all of the panel saws, hand saws, everything are in the saw till. I do have a couple hanging on the wall. My um, half back and my miter box saw are there on the wall. This is uh, the reason they're over here is my sawing alley, if you will, is right here. So as I bring rough sawn material into the shop, it comes right up along the side of the bench. My saw bench comes out and I'm able to reach right for my saw till right here up against the wall. So in other words, all of the rough sawing that I do, and if you've watched any of my videos where I, I'm using a handsaw, the, the recent handsaw video live that I just did probably a couple months ago was all done on this side of the bench because I have open access from the back wall all the way to the front door in my shop. So I literally could run straight from the car, rough lumber right in here onto the saw bench with my saw bents, uh, my in-feed and out-feed support, and, and do all the sawing right there. That's why all of my saws, my hand saws, are over here on the wall. The back saws, all of my joinery saws, live in a couple different places. Let me remove this little ad off the bottom here. Um, I have hand saws, I've got a sash saw that lives right here inside my bench. This is the saw that I use probably the most when I'm working here at my Rubo workbench. This is my primary crosscut saw, all the dados that I saw, uh, tenon shoulders, uh, uh, milling boards to a certain length, it's all done with this saw, which is why it's actually the only saw that lives here in my bench because I, this is where I'm standing when I need it. I do have a couple dovetail saws in this drawer that are there for specific purposes, my half blind dovetail saw because I do my half blind work over here. Um, my other back saws actually live below where the camera's sitting on my joinery bench. I have uh, a couple of saws, my dovetail saw and my carcass saw are actually in a tool well right on the back of the joinery bench, which I suppose I can show it. It's just a little hard to where the camera is situated right now. So um, 
dovetail saw, carcass saw, right there in the tool well on the back of my joiner bench because my joiner bench is where I do all my dovetailing. So I put my dovetail saw right within the arm's reach. Underneath the joiner bench is a shelf and that's where I've got my tenon saws. So again, it's all about where do you use the saws. When I'm sawing tenons, sometimes I'm at the front vise on my joiner bench. Most of the time I'm here on my leg vise. So I'm setting up the piece to saw. And actually, while you see me saw a lot of tenons from this side of the bench when the camera's on, I actually do quite a bit of sawing from the other side of the bench. But it's hard to get a good camera angle there. So when it comes to filming, I generally am standing here. But that's also the reason why my tenon saws are directly underneath the camera. So I've got a piece that I want to saw a tenon onto. I put it into the vise. I turn over here, grab a tenon saw, and I'm good to go. So that's the, the, the easy answer of where they're stored and why. Um, they're stored where I use them the most. I've thought often about building a, kind of a saw till of sorts for my um, uh, back saws, but I just don't see that as being beneficial. I would store them all in one place and I use my back saws in different spots around the shop, which is why they're stored in different spots around the shop. Um, as I'm neck deep into a project, a lot of times one of the saws will migrate its way onto the bench and just live there the whole time as well. So there we go. Um, uh, Jeffrey had asked how I feel about sawing dovetail angles so vertically. So I've got the board held vertically, but the angle of the dovetail is going to be at some angle to this. So a lot of people will suggest actually rotating the board in the vise so that dovetail angle is now vertical. It's a perfectly reasonable way to saw. Um, my thoughts are I've done it several times. I personally don't find that it's necessary. Um, first of all, it can be a pain because you've got to rotate the board and, and match that angle. And then when you do the other side, you've got to rotate the board again. It's just an extra step. <clears throat> the angle and, and the reasoning behind this is if the angle is vertical, you're holding the saw plumb and the saw is balanced. The back saw is balanced when it's running straight up and down, at least a well-balanced back saw is. The minute you tilt one angle and another, it loses its balance. It's going to be hard to kind of track a particular line. The reason that I don't find this particularly important is I always cut, not always, but 99% of the time I cut my tails first on dovetails. And when you cut tails first, that angle does not matter because whatever the angle is, whether it matches or not, or it's 12 degrees, 15 degrees, 99.74444 repeating three degrees, does not matter because you transfer that angle to your pin board. And whatever that angle is, is now on your pin board. And as we know with the pin board, you set that vertical. And now instead of sawing an angle this way, I'm sawing an angle this way. And it's about positioning my body to saw that angle. So whether or not I've nailed that angle on the tailboard doesn't really make much a difference. So I've just discovered that going through that extra step is superfluous. It slows me down. But I also don't find that most dovetails, like if you're doing a carcass side that's seven eighths of an inch or three quarters of an inch thick, that's about the deepest dovetail saw cut you're going to make. Obviously there are some weird exceptions like, you know, dovetails on my workbench or something. But for the most part, the saw cut is only about three quarters of an inch deep. A lot of times it's much uh, shallower than that. Drawer sides, half an inch, three eighths of an inch thick. That cut is really, really shallow. So while you're sawing at an angle, you're sawing at an angle for like two or three saw strokes. So the extra step of lining it up, I don't know. I, I feel like it's, it's entirely unnecessary. But if you are really struggling hitting an angle, that can be a step to help you over that. So just something to think about. I think definitely uh, you will find that you graduate beyond that um, little idea uh, very quickly. Okay, so let's jump into uh, how fat is flat. And for those of you in the chat room, by all means, feel free to ask questions. If you hadn't noticed already further up in the chat, put them in all caps. It allows me to see them a little bit easier. So um, how flat is flat enough? The answer is it depends on the situation. I often say, if you have to ask, it's flat enough. Most of us, and me included, who grew up kind of in the power tool world of things, 
were taught that flatness was like this holy grail. This was absolutely the most important thing ever. Even then, as I started to integrate hand tools into things, I was constantly beating into my head that the flatness and stock prep um, was so important to the success of everything. Your dovetails will suck unless you did really good stock prep. Your mortise and tenons will suck, your casework will suck, unless you had perfectly flat, perfectly square boards. As I have cast off power tools and moved into a solely hand tool existence, that ain't true. It's just not true. And my understanding of flatness changes from board to board, from project to project, from joint to joint. And what I've discovered more than anything, the greatest time saver in hand tool work is skipping that stuff and not having to deal with really, really flat boards or sometimes even plain boards. Working with a rough sawn surface is all you need. And this goes back to what I said at the outset. Because I don't have a board referencing it's a table saw surface or a bandsaw surface or what have you, it's not important for that to be flat. It is important, however, to think about what will be referencing off of that surface. When we talk about reference surfaces a lot, especially when it comes to joinery and casework. Um, just recently, uh, I do a live demo um, in the hand tool school for apprentices every single month, and we tackle all kinds of fun stuff. We did this three-way bridal joint this particular month, and reference surfaces were incredibly important in this. These three pieces are exactly the same. They're dimensioned exactly the same, the joinery is cut exactly the same, and the joinery, the bridal joints, are all the same dimensions. It was imperative when it came to prepare these pieces, knowing that I was going to be using reference surfaces on all of these faces, it was imperative that I mark a reference face and a reference edge, that those be square to one another, and I did all of my layout off of the reference face and the reference edge. So as I was running this angled shoulder line around this piece. I could take my bevel gauge, let me just grab a bevel gauge. I'm gonna need this router plane later anyway. I could take my bevel gauge and I could reference it off of this edge, because this is my reference edge, and run this line across. But I wanted the line to go all the way around the board because I needed to reference it on both sides. This miter joint had to be cut on both faces, or I guess you could call it, excuse me, bridal joint. I guess you could call these two dados that had to be cut. So I needed to make sure that I could run this line all the way around the board. So I reference off this face, and then I used my square to reference off this reference face to square the line down, square the line down on the other face, but I couldn't flip it around and reference the bevel off this face because this was not one of my two reference faces. This one was because I knew that it was perfectly square to that. So instead of referencing the square off of that, I come back to my original reference face and run the line there. And that's how you ensure that you get like your lines to meet up all the way around because you're using the same reference faces over and over and over again. And on a complex joint like this, where all this is super important, it is imperative that you have those reference faces marked. <clears throat> but how flat do those reference faces have to be? And in this particular joint, and this is kind of a complex one, so I won't go too much into detail here, but really the only part where this joint meets another section is just in this little area. All of this board down here, from here to here, completely irrelevant. Now, obviously, if this were fit into a piece of furniture, you know, there would be some sort of reference. If this were stretchers on the bottom of a table, you would have reference surfaces out here where there'd be a mortise and tendon into a leg or something. So as I was milling these boards, I was particularly um, conscious of making sure that I had kind of the first half of it nice and flat <clears throat> to be able to um, mate against one another. But even then, the ingrain isn't really a reference surface here because this could be proud and could be plain flush. So was it really important to get that flat? Well, it was important to get this angle flat because I laid out my baseline by running a gauge against that end grain. So suddenly the end grain became important, making sure that it was flat and making sure that it was at this angle. This is a, a 60 degree angle so that I could appropriately lay out my baseline. So there it's very important. These faces, they are not important at all because the joinery was actually cut into the face. It was sawn in 
it needed to be, we'll just call it flat-ish because I did run a gauge along this face in order to gauge the depth of that cut. And I did run a router plane along this face to refine the bottom of that dado. So you can say, yes, this face needs to be flat, but really this face only needs to be as flat as the sole of the router plane. So if I had this wall, these walls on either side of this, this bridle were at different heights, then the router plane would sit at an angle and that would be bad. So I would have to have it coplanar just over this distance in order to get um, a good clean surface on the floor of this bridle joint. So you can see the flatness quotient, yeah, this needs to be flat, but it only has to be flat over this distance. So now that changes things. Flat, the definition of flat, you know, could be uh, defined as like the deviation um, from, a, from a plane. You know, how flat is that? Well, in order to be able to answer that question, you have to have how much deviation over a set distance. How much deviation do I have over six inches, over 12 inches, over 24 inches? And that's really what you have to think about. Ideally, flat is, you know, very little deviation. Um, we'll say a thousandth of an inch deviation, but a thousandth of an inch deviation over three inches, that's, that's really easy to get. A thousandth of an inch deviation over 36 inches or six, six feet, now that's a totally different tolerance. That's NASA tolerance at that point. And that's what you have to think in terms of. Not, you know, how flat is flat enough, but over what distance do I need to be flat? In a previous episode, in a previous week, I was talking about sawing, and one of the fastest ways to flatten a board is with a saw. Um, and I was actually using this board, or one of these boards, as a demonstration. When you are milling up your parts for a project, the first thing you should do is be sawing those parts closer to size. Because instead of now having to flatten these pieces of cherry over this 48 inch length, if my part is only 12 inches long, now I just need to flatten that board over that 12 inch length. That changes the tolerance, makes it super easy to get it flat, and it also even changes the plane that you use. You know, if I'm only flattening a board that's 12 inches long, I'm probably just gonna grab my jack plane. It doesn't make sense to be using, you know, my big long joinery plane on a board that's not even as long as the plane. So there's a lot of decisions that go into play there. And it's actually one of the reasons that I often say that the joinery plane, the jointer plane rather, <coughs> is overrated. A lot of people are like, I've gotta have a jointer plane as like my first or maybe second plane. I'd put it at like the eighth plane. Cause most of the furniture parts we deal with are really not all that long. And the level of flatness that you can get from a typical jack plane is going to give you much greater flatness than you ever think you're gonna need. The jointer plane, <clears throat> say you've got your jointer plane set to take five thousandths of an inch thick shaving. Don't say you've got your jointer plane set to take a thousandths of an inch shaving, because what are you doing? Like, seriously, what, are, you, are you trying to split an atom with that level of flatness? That's just ridiculous. If you flatten a board to a thousandths inch thickness tolerance over a 22 or 24 inch jointer plane surface, walk away for an hour and it won't be that flat an hour later because the board is going to move more than the tolerance that you just set for it with that joiner plane. So that's the other thing you have to think about. The wood is always moving. I'm in the middle of a thunderstorm right now. The humidity is skyrocketing and once the thunderstorm moves out of the way, it's gonna drop again dramatically. Any flattening I do right now will be different in two hours because of that dramatic humidity change. But even doesn't have to be that dramatic. When you're talking about a thousandth of an inch deviation over the course of 24 inches, that is so unbelievably flat that the tiniest little bit of movement in the board is going to change that tolerance. So you, you have to think about the wood movement, but you also have to think about how big is the part to begin with? And what role does that part play? So let's look at a couple of examples. <clears throat> um, the most extreme would be when you've got to take, like my bench top here, I've got 
This bench top is glued up with a bunch of eight quarter stock on edge. It's four and a half inches thick. So I took four and a half inch wide pieces and I planed the faces and then glued those faces together. So now I've got uh, a almost five inch wide face that is nine feet long that needs to mate together cleanly. That's really flat, or is it? The longer the board, the more flex you're gonna have in that board. So here again, what do I ultimately need? I need these faces to come together flat in a nice glue surface when I put clamps on it. So if I were just gluing up a bench top that was only this long, I would want this to be pretty dang flat. And I can hold this together and just shine a light on it. You can see I've got a good mating surface there. If there were any gaps that showed up, there's a, a little bit, you can see that dark line, a little bit of a gap there. I can close that with finger pressure, very little finger pressure for that matter. That's flat enough. So there's your first test. I've got these two boards. I know that they're gonna mate together like this. I'm sitting here, I'm planing these boards. Is this flat enough? Well, put them together as you're going to assemble it. And certainly you could put the clamps on it and see, can you close up the joint under clamps? Clamps will exert a lot of pressure. You know, my parallel clamps get like 3,600 pounds per square inch of pressure. There is a point where, yes, you can clamp a joint closed, but you're introducing so much tension into it that that could actually pose a problem later. So the real test is not can I close the joint under clamping pressure, but can I close it under finger pressure? You know, I don't know what kind of pounds per square inch I can generate with my thumb and, you know, first two fingers. It's not 30, 3,600 pounds per square inch, I can tell you that much. But just being able to close that joint with hand pressure tells me that I'm flat enough. Moreover, just going through the exercise of trying to close this joint, and if I can't get it closed, you can actually feel where the high spots are. You know, if there were a high spot in the middle, you would feel this top board rocking back and forth, and you know that there's a high spot somewhere there. If all of the gaps are in the middle and you're closing that and you're having to exert a lot of force to close that, well, you know you've got high spots somewhere on the ends and you can address that appropriately. But just close it with hand pressure and you're good to go. The length here, the, the tolerance, right, the amount of flatness over this length, we don't know whether it's flat within three thousandths of an inch, six thousandths of an inch, or one thousandths of an inch. All we know is that we can close the gap with hand pressure. And again, if this were six feet long, I could have a, probably a quarter inch gap here, and as long as I can close that with finger pressure, I'm flat enough. So that's the other thing to think about. If you can't close it with finger pressure, as I said, if you're having to rely upon the extreme force of a clamp, and I close that gap over six foot length, there is a possibility that, that those um, opposing bows could introduce tension, could telegraph through the entire assembly and possibly could cause twist in the board or cause some bowing that could cause problems with a later assembly, like laying the bench top down on top of legs. If you've got a lot of tension in there, that could be a problem later. It could even be a problem as seasonal movement, humidity changes, causes the boards to move on their own, which is why you don't want to try to close all your joinery with clamps. I say that knowing full well that I have done it, I have certainly done it, but if you really find yourself like bearing down on a parallel clamp to close a joint, take a step back, you know, walk away, get a drink, come back and try to fix it. If you're using something like one of these quick, quick clamps, I don't know what the pounds per square inch on these is, but it's not 3,600 pounds per square inch. You could use one of these to close a joint, I suppose, especially, you know, if you, maybe you have arthritis or something and your ability to close a joint by hand pressure is really weak. So that's the first thing. Can you close it with hand pressure? Next thing, you need to think about what are the reference surfaces and what do we need to actually accomplish by the, the joint or the mate that we're making. So I've shown this cabinet a lot of times. I've called this my demonstration cabinet. I've used this to demo cutting datas. I've used it to patch datas when you put the data on the wrong spot. Recently, I used it in a demonstration on nails to put the shiplap panels on the back. I did a demonstration in the hand tool school about cutting uh, cross grain moldings. So I cut an ovalo molding across the grain here with the idea that this is going to be the top for this particular cabinet. So I have to, I can position this the way I want it, but now I have to figure out 
are my mating surfaces flat enough? Well, I've got pretty good surface up front here, but I've got some gaps in the back. And some of that is a couple of these shiplap boards are a little proud of the surface. And I've got, and I'll talk about this straight edge in just a minute. I have a little bit of a, a bow. So there's a low spot in the center of the board. That's probably from the pine I was using. There's every possibility that um, when I nailed it together, I don't know, there, there's just a little bit of, of cup in there. Well, in this instance, we're already in an assembled case. There's not a whole lot I'm gonna do here. I could, um, and, and this is just gonna get glued on to the, to the top because all the wood movement is in concert. So I would come in and determine, is that good enough? Um, the gaps I'm seeing in the back are caused by the overlapping shiplap boards, but it would be, a, I would want to hold the piece in situ, again, try to close any gaps that I'm seeing and de determine whether it's flat enough from there. And if I have determined, no, it's not flat enough, then I can begin to analyze where the high spots are, what I have to remove. In this case, I need to remove this little bit of shiplap board here, a little bit there, and a little bit right there to allow it to sit flat in the back. Or maybe I don't, because this is gonna be a wall-mounted cabinet. This backside is never gonna be seen. And because the high spots are here at the back of the cabinet, all that's doing is tilting it slightly forward so that I've got a perfect match on the front here. So then I have to ask myself, is this a reference surface? The mating surface is good. I'm, I'm good to go. I can glue that up, I can screw that together. Um, I probably wouldn't want to glue this because the shiplap in the back is causing about a sixteenth of an inch gap. So in other words, the board is tilted forward. If I tried to glue it, I would only get a good glue surface right at the front, which would probably be enough, frankly, for you know, a, a wall shelf like this. Or I could just screw it together, you know, put some screws in underneath and make it removable if necessary. But then I have to figure out, well, what does that do to this top surface? This is a show surface, you know, it's probably not going to be seen all that much if I were to mount it at, at this height, you know, I can get on my tiptoes and see the top of my tool cabinet, but I'm six foot four. You know, how many people are going to be able to actually see the top of this? Or maybe it's going to be mounted down lower and the top is going to be seen, or maybe it's going to be, you know, another display surface and things are going to go on top of it, or maybe round things are going to go on top of it. So if I have by not trimming the ship up on the back, essentially tilted it forward. If I put something on there, if I put a pencil on there, is it gonna roll off? Um, and this is the same thing if you're talking about a dining room table, a coffee table, or whatever. This surface is purely a show surface. So I want this to be, how flat do I need this to be? I actually don't need this to be flat at all. I need this to be pretty more than anything else until that show surface, that display surface becomes a functional surface. Now I'm resting a wine glass on it. I'm setting a plate on it. I'm setting, resting a book on it. I'm doing, I'm using it as a functional surface to put things on. You could call this um, decorative shelf a functional surface in the fact that I'm going to set a knickknack on it or something like that. But you know, a candlestick, a big brass candlestick would require a very, very out of flat surface for it not to rest appropriately. Moreover, you know, say that candlestick, it's only this little area that needs to be flat that the candlestick references off of. So right away, the is it flat enough becomes a totally different story here. This flatness of this particular surface is entirely unimportant. The tear out free nature of it, the beauty of it, the whether or not it has plain tracks on it. In other words, how prepped is it for finish is what is most important, which is why we make smoothing planes shorter than jack planes and joiner planes. Because as we know, the shorter the sole, the more it will ride through those hills and valleys. This plane, this is a number two especially, and this number four, these are not designed to flatten boards. They're designed to ride in those hills and valleys and remove tear out. So that's why I love this number two. This is my favorite smoothing plane because it is so small. I don't have to do very, I, I don't have to do, I have to do very little flattening of a board in order to get this to take a full length shaving and run, you know, one into the other and give me a tear out free surface. It's set up 
tuned to take, very tight mouth, very sharp blade, tuned to take a smoothing plane finish. So that end result of that surface ends up not being a matter of flat, it mean, ends up being a matter of aesthetics. And you, you look at it that way. Again, if you lower this down into a table format, you know, you need it to be flat enough that things are going to rest on it. You don't want your plates rocking on the table because it's that out of flat, but think about it. If I have a surface that has a, a dining plate on it, you know, let's pick, pick a board here. Any board. This looks like a dining plate. It's a square dining plate. I have to get this board to reference on my, my little dining table here without rocking around. Like we've all sat at those tables in restaurants where the feet aren't level and you're constantly rocking it every time you lean forward. That's annoying. Imagine if the plate were doing the same thing. So I can tell you right now, this bit of big box pine is not flat. I mean, it's got a cup to it and it's rocking around like crazy. We'll just ignore that and put the cup down so that it's referencing here. So now I can take, you know, this plate and hold it up against this surface or let's go with something a bit wider. So this is my tabletop. I want it to register cleanly. There is a tiny bit of movement here, but I think again, that's more the out of flat plate, quote plate. But this board, my tabletop, is perfectly flat enough to handle that. And that's the next thing you have to think about, whether this is a show surface or a joinery surface, what has to reference off that? So, say this board is now the side of a case and I'm going to put a sliding dovetail or a dado in here in order to house a shelf. Well, the board needs to be flat across the width so that the shelf end mates against it cleanly. Or does it? You guys are going to get tired of hearing me say that. Or does it? Because, as we talked about before, we want to be able to close the joint with hand pressure. And this case, just put together using big box pine. I did no planing. This came right off the shelf at Home Depot. I sawed it to shape. I did no planing whatsoever. There was a cup. Again, let's talk semantics here. When you're talking about warp and a board, if the board is curved across the face, that is a cup. If it's curved along the length, that's called the bow. And we know what a twist is. So if the, this board has a cup, had a cup, I should say, I cut a dado in here and then not only did I put glue in there, but I also used nails to secure that dado. The glue, the nails, well, the glue and clamps, the nails in this case are my clamps. The nails drew it up against the ingrain of the shelf and essentially flattened out the cup in three points here, here, and here. So now there really is no cup in these boards anymore. So whether or not the surface that I'm cutting the dado into is flat, isn't really important because a lot of times the joinery itself can pull things into alignment. It's what a breadboard does. A breadboard in prevents a table from cupping. It restrains it more than preventing it. So you start with something flat, you stick the board on the end and it just kind of holds it in line. Running battens under a tabletop does the same thing. So if I wanted to cut a dado in this board, I could, and you know, the size of this board, it'd be super fast to just flatten this with a hand plane. This would take maybe 30 seconds to flatten this board. But say it's a bookshelf and it's six feet long. Really what I need to do is focus on flattening along where that dado goes, across the length of the dado. Then you have to think, well, do I want to eliminate the whole cup? Because say, say there's a significant cup and if this were a bookcase, that was 12 inches deep, it's, you're going to find cup in that board. I don't care how well seasoned it is, how well milled it was, again, it's probably going to cup just through seasonal changes. You could flatten it and then very quickly cut the dado um, and then everything, assemble everything together and keep it flat. That's one way, you know, things like tongue and groove joinery, I highly recommend cutting the tongue and groove and then assembling the tongue and groove because the, the tolerance on that tongue and groove is so tight 
that the tiniest little movement will allow you be very difficult to put it together later. So there's an instance where assemble it right away and just let the joinery hold it flat. <clears throat> In this instance though, if there were a cup here and I took this to a table saw, to a dado blade, I would run it over the table saw blade and the dado in the center would be shallower than the dado at the end because the cup is causing essentially the board to move away from the blade. It's higher in that middle and you're not getting an even dado. So what's the hybrid woodworker to do, right? You cut your dado on the table saw, then you come back with a router plane and you refine that dado and you remove that little bit of extra material where there was the cup because the router plane now only has a reference surface this big, whatever this is, three inches, as compared to the full 12 inches. So again, how flat is flat enough changes from the tool that's being used. If I'm using the table saw, flat enough is this whole board needs to be flat from edge to edge to get a perfect data. But if I'm gonna come at it with a router plane, it only needs to be flat over this distance. So in other words, this plane could ride down and ride back up the other side as long as the radius of that curve is not too tight for this width of the router plane blade or the depth of the router plane sole to navigate that curve. And that's where how flat is flat enough totally changes. Same board, same project, same reference surfaces, but the tooling is different. Now, we are assuming that it's not so out of flat that once I've cut that and once I've got the, the shelf in place that again, I can bottom out that dado or I can flex out the cup and the board with hand pressure. If it's a six foot long board, it's gonna be hard to close it with hand pressure. So sometimes clamps can be brought to bear. The really important thing here is this surface, the end of the shelf, because you're not flexing in grain whatsoever. This is the strongest dimension of the board. This force down along the end grain is what we call max crushing strength. If you look at technical specs of boards, you will see these numbers measured in the millions and millions of pounds per square inch. This is the strongest dimension. You're not gonna flex that. So you, couldn't, you can't take an edge that's slightly out of flat here and expect it to nestle in a dado at all. It's always gonna rock uh, if there's a high spot there. So the important part is actually not the flatness of this board, but the flatness of this face. The flatness of this face in the shelf may not be important at all, actually. Um, depending upon the length, you know, it may not, you may not have to worry about it. Again, you don't want your, cell, you don't want your shelves to have a you know, dramatic bow to them because that will look weird. But it all comes down to a very relative uh, understanding of things, which leads me to my straight edge. Because um, the, the tipping point that actually brought this uh, subject up today was uh, one of the uh, patrons who'd asked, he's been struggling with a straight edge and wondering if he's getting a little too, uh, I don't know, shall we say precious with it. This is a 36 inch long straight edge. This was actually a project um, in the hand tool school. Ironically enough, it was a straight edge, but it was an applied project teaching people how to refine curves. I know, it doesn't make sense, right? But the top of this is actually curved and then there's a little molding detail cut into the end. So this was a simple project to be able to, to cut a curve and then refine a curve using a spoke shave. The bottom or the business end of this is flat. <clears throat> How flat is flat enough? Well, I happen to have from my power tool days, one of these super fancy and I may add expensive and entirely unnecessary Veritas straight edges. I bought this originally thinking I absolutely had to have it in order to true up my power joiner. And yes, it was beneficial for truing a power joiner. Although I will tell you these days, I know of much easier ways to do it than using something like uh, a, a precision straight edge. This precision straight edge, what is this, 48 inches? And it's like precise to within like less than a thousandth of an inch. This sucker is flat. NASA tolerance flat, you know, flatness measured with like scientific numerals <laughs> times 10 to the whatever power that level of flatness. It is very, very precise. So I can take this straight edge and hold this straight edge up against it, and put a little light behind it, and it's pretty good. I can see some light, a tiny bit of light in the middle, 
I'm not going to measure it, but I'd venture to say that it's probably less than 128th of an inch. I don't have any field gauges in my shop, but it's very, very low. But here's the thing. I have to really hold this directly in front of the bulb in order to see any light whatsoever under that. If I hold it up like this, now I'm staring right into the lights, it's a little harder to see. If I hold it up like that, I don't see any light under that. So this is flat. This is really flat. I haven't flattened this in eight years. This is pretty much as it was created. And I use this all the time as my primary reference tool to determine is this board that I'm planing flat or I use this as my diagnosis tool for any spot planing I do. I use this to tell me, not that anybody needed a straight edge to tell you that that board is, is cupped, but this is what I use. In order to create this, I took a board, chucked it in my vise, and I used my joiner plane. Um, because it's super easy to get this level of flatness because the board itself isn't very thick. So you can take one pass with a plane and get the entire surface. Now, if this were six inches wide, this would be a much more difficult board to get this level of flatness. Moreover, it would be difficult to maintain that level of flatness because, you know, seasonal movement is going to affect the board cupping and things like that. So if you are building a straight edge out of wood in your shop, I would not obsess over it. Um, this length, and if I've got a board that's super, super flat here, this length is going to give me so much more flatness than I actually require. Moreover, I wouldn't want to necessarily rely on this if I've got super, super long boards. Again, eight foot long boards, six foot long boards. This will give me a good idea of the flatness. Like I can check the flatness of my workbench, you know, nine foot long workbench with a three foot long straight edge. But again, if it's a furniture part or a project part, you're gonna have that flex in the board and you're never really going to get you know, a nine foot board perfectly flat without it moving on you. So you have to start putting it into perspective. Can I get my straight edge? Can I make a five foot long straight edge that's flat to within a thousand of an inch? I probably can, but do I need it? Like where, give me a use case where I'm gonna need to assess the flatness of, of, of a project part that requires a five foot long thousands of an inch straight edge. More than anything, what I find using the straight edge for is for feel rather than sight. And I've got some questions in the chat room, but I just want to do this one thing, basically because I'm tired of talking and then let's actually make some shavings here. Too much talking, not enough woodworking. So I've got a piece of poplar here. And what am I going to use this piece of poplar for? Actually, I have a purpose for this. This is going to be um, drawer bottom. So I'm eventually going to need to resaw it. So really what I would probably do first is go ahead and resaw the thing, but let's plane one face first. So I'm going to use my straight edge and how flat is my straight edge? We already know from checking it against the fancy Veritas straight edge that it's really flat, but say we didn't know that. I don't really care. I can look at this and go, that's pretty dang flat. I can take my plane up to it, run along it and go, that's pretty dang flat. I, I can, if I'm not sure, I can chuck it in my vise, use my jack plane or my joiner plane if I want to be really precise and take one consistent shaving from end to end. And then I know that's really flat because I've got, you know, the shaving coming out of that is three, four, five thousandths of an inch thick. That's really flat. So I don't really care exactly how flat this is, but this does give me um, forgive the expression, a measuring stick. This is not going to change on me during the process of this, of this planing. So if this is not really, really flat, it doesn't really matter right now. So I'm going to use it as a reference guide, not reference as in flat, but as a control. Think of it in scientific terms, a control as to how flat the board is. So what I can do again, I can get down here and see if there's light underneath it, but instead, what I do is I run the straight edge back and forth across the board, very light grip, and I feel for where it's dragging. And as I run this across the board, I can feel that it's dragging at the edges. 
and I can even just feel a gap underneath the straight edge. So I know without even looking at it that I've got a high spot here and a high spot there. As I run it lengthwise along the board, again, feeling where it's dragging, sometimes just grabbing it right in the middle can really help. I've got a high spot right here. I can feel as I move the, the straight edge across, this edge kind of, this little spot right here lags because there's a high spot there. And there's a high spot there. So let me switch to a closer view. So I've used my crayon to mark my high spots just by touch and by how the straight edge drags. Now I can come in here and really put some light behind it and see, sure enough, there's a high spot there. There's a little lump right there in the board. Yep, and there's a high spot there. A little kind of raised up. Actually, what we're more looking at, I think, is there's a little bit of kind of twisting action where the, the cup is pretty much, the bottom of the cup is pretty much right in the center here and the bottom of the cup is more here, so it raises up a little bit more on this side. I could do the same thing with winding sticks, and the winding sticks would tell me that this, this corner is higher than this corner. They wouldn't be perfectly parallel. But for all intents and purposes, it doesn't really matter too much right now because I've just been able to use the straight edge to quickly identify where those high spots are, and I can come in and really I should be using a four plane for this but let's just stick with the jack plane let's just take a heavier cut whoa too heavy Taking like <laughs> close to an eighth of an inch thick shaving here. That's a bit extreme. Um, where the spot plane method can fall down using a longer jack plane like that is it can be difficult to actually remove little spots. So I'm going to switch to a scrub and just hit a little high spot. Let me put that in frame a little better. And now, still got a bit of a low spot in the middle, but it's a heck of a lot better. This high spot is now gone. So it's low in the middle, but it's uniformly low. Same thing up here. So what I need to do, and why we have the scrub plane is just keep it up. check again. Boom. I'm flat all the way across. As I move this straight edge back and forth, I can feel it very uniformly dragging. And it's very hard to describe, but you will know it when you feel it. It's a very distinct, it's a very solid feel. Whereas if it's only grabbing in a couple of spots, it slides a little easier over the surface. But when the whole length of the straight edge is sliding, there's a lot of friction in place and it actually can be difficult to slide it over the surface. So this board, you can clearly see roughs on there, roughs on there, and only plain in these areas, but this board I consider to be flat, depending on how I want to use it. So what did I say I'm going to do with this? I said that I need to resaw it into drawer sides. Well, this board is flat enough for what I want to do there. I can very easily now take a gauge, run it against this flat-ish surface in order to create a line all around my board that I can resaw to. Then it comes, you know, now I've got my two, two thinner boards that I want to mill into uh, a drawer bottom. 
Well, then it's a, a little bit different story. I do want to obviously get rid of the roughs on marks and maybe pay a little bit more attention to getting it flat, getting rid of the undulations left by the scrub plane. But at the same time, a drawer bottom, in most cases, is housed in a groove. And it's housed in a groove across the front of the drawer and left open in the back of the drawer so it can expand and contract out the back. So that groove actually, much like a breadboard, can help hold the panel flat, especially that groove in the drawer front that you know is set into usually the thicker drawer front. That will help to flatten out any cup. And when you've got a drawer bottom that's usually a half an inch thick, sometimes um, my drawer bottoms I tend to make a lot thinner than that, um, it's really easy to flex that thinner board. So the level of flatness required there in many instances isn't that flat because the drawer groove is just going to flex out that out of flatness, that possible cup that you have. So again, the drawer bottom, in this particular instance, this is going to be a drawer bottom, may end up needing to be more pretty than anything else. The reference parts, the flat parts, the square parts are actually the edges. You know, because I want it to house perfectly inside the groove of the drawer. I want just the right amount hanging at the back. Say if I'm using the, the drawer back. Oops, I just pulled it the wrong way. There we go. Um, a lot of times I will use the drawer back here is a little proud of the case because I'm actually using that as a stop. Now, yes, the, the reveal in the drawer front will actually change with seasonal expansion and contraction, but over the All right, I think we're back. Hopefully, we're back. We shall see. Somebody give me a shout out in the chat room. Can you guys see this? Are we back on now? Sure looks like it is on my end. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody see me? Things were just getting good. Stupid power outage. The true irony of the hand tool shop. I can do everything without power, just not stream live over the internet. All right. Well, according to YouTube, it is running. And ideally, you should all be able to see me. So I think if nothing else, I'll finish off my little presentation here, answer a few questions, and if nothing else, it'll show up in the recording later. So, um, so as I was saying, the key with this drawer bottom now is that the edges become the reference surfaces. And you know, I've got to set it to an exact width to fit inside the groove of the drawer, so I need to create a, a flat edge and then use a panel gauge or a ruler or however to measure the opposite edge and strike a parallel line and then create a flat and parallel edge there. But, and there's a question in the chat room actually about the difference between faces and edges. There is no difference between faces and edges. They're all faces. They're all reference faces. And whether or not it's flat or not doesn't matter whether it's the edge of a board, the end of a board, or a face. So again, from a semantics term, I always refer to the widest surface as the face, and then the edge, and then the end, well, that's the end grain. That's always, will always, always, always be the end. You know, if you've got a, a perfect block, a perfectly square piece, like a four by four, there can be some confusion over what's the face and what's the edge. Doesn't really matter. Maybe in the context of a project, it will matter. But faces and edges in terms of flatness are exactly the same. Geometrically speaking, faces, planes, um, are all the same. And whether or not they're flat, doesn't matter where it is in the board. So relevance of flatness, I will say, like I said with the straight edge, which by the way, uh, I think it was Bob that asked, this straight edge is Sapili. The 
flatness of this edge, you can increase the tolerance. Again, I'm never going to get that right. Engineers correct me, whether I'm lowering the tolerance or increasing the tolerance, making it flatter, in other words. I think lowering the tolerance. Because tolerance means if I have a higher tolerance, it means I will accept more, right? I'm accepting less. I want a lower tolerance. I want a flatter edge. Well, while I've got 36 inches, I only have about 7 eighths of an inch wide. So, you know, stack that down, you know, cut this into 12 inch pieces. We'll just round up 